screen and presentation. And I have a great pleasure to welcome you to us, uh, Pavel. We are looking forward to your presentation. And I would like to say that Pavel is uh, from uh, Danish Technical University in Denmark. And he has worked for many, many years uh, within indoor uh, uh, quality issues. And he's uh, well known uh, and recognized internationally uh, scientist. Pavel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Aneta. And thank you for inviting me to this WESIAC meeting. Um, I'm terribly sorry that I cannot be uh, the uh, as in a person and we have to um, have this virtual meeting, but I hope that um, nevertheless you will enjoy my presentation. Uh, just Aneta, please confirm that uh, you can see my presentation and everything is fine. Yes, everything is okay. We can hear you and we can see your presentation. Excellent. <laughs> so, um, well, this presentation was prepared before pandemic and um, and of course, I could twist uh, this presentation and discuss what is a healthy building when we have a pandemic, or what is a healthy building uh, when the pandemic is over uh, or after pandemic. But I would like really to discuss the problems that we have experienced before pandemic, and that those problems still remain in buildings, even though we have now a pandemic of uh, COVID-19 around the world. So. Um, in the very uh, end of my talk, I will probably say a few words about the, um, the healthy building in the pandemic, but just very little. There is a lot of documents available now, <clears throat> and we are still collecting information on uh, and try to set up the uh, guidelines on what to do with buildings and how to operate buildings during pandemic. So I start with the uh, first present uh, first slide, and then there is a small cartoon, and it's <coughs> that says that uh, this office sick, uh, uh, has sick building syndrome. It found yesterday using a croaky voice to say it wasn't coming in, and I, I just show this uh, as uh, because um, we are talking about sick buildings, and uh, and we are talking about healthy buildings, but basically my presentation will. Um, draw attention to that we are we should start to talk about uh, healthy or sick occupants in buildings i'll start my presentation to complain to complain about 2020 that i cannot come to um, lund and uh, that you know we cannot meet and we cannot uh, collaborate as we used to collaborate but still, I think the opportunities are there, and then uh, sooner or la uh, later we will be having a chance to meet again. So what is my motivation for this talk? Well, basically, the motivation is that the building uh, sector is under very quick transformation. What we see here is the initiatives, initiatives in a building sector that basically lead to um, changes of mainly energy use in buildings. <clears throat> buildings are retrofitted quickly. Uh, the new materials are coming into the buildings. The new solutions are coming into the buildings. But the perspective mainly is on the energy. And during this um, important um, transformation of a building, we do not um, see the opportunity or maybe the opportunity is not properly grasped to um, make um, additional changes in a building environment that would lead to significant improvements of the conditions of, for, people, for people staying in those. Furthermore, <clears throat> we see a dramatic change of, I would say dramatic because these are dramatic change of different para um, conditions in buildings. I list only a few here, but of course <clears throat> there, there, there are many, many others. So first of all, um, the conditions outdoors, because of a climate change and the CO2 is changing, that has an implication of how we control ventilation in buildings using CO2. <clears throat> I'll come back to this later. The temperatures are outside are also increasing. 
we have also very, <clears throat> I would say, explosive weather conditions or dramatic changing weather conditions where we have uh, <clears throat> high temperatures, uh, high precipitation, and generally higher temperatures. And the question is that whether the building uh, and building and air environment in buildings is resilient to those changes. Ozone is increasing. On the good side is that we don't have tobacco smoke in public spaces, although e-cigarettes become extremely popular. Um, energy and green building uh, are on uh, setting the agenda for research and um, both building certification schemes are flourishing. And nearly every country or every region in the world has a, a building certification scheme. And among those building certification schemes, and I'll come back to this, that <clears throat> there is no common agreement on how to define the, in the conditions in indoor environment, and they use a different certification criteria to do that, or classification criteria. And despite of the our um, aim to reduce energy, energy use nearly double. And then how we design our offices. Uh, and of course, now uh, we have a new challenge that we convert our homes into offices, but generally our offices do not look like the traditional offices. These are open spaces with um, this active office design and so on. That would also require a different rethinking on how we design indoor environment. And there is an ubiquitous use of uh, uh, technologies, and this is our meeting today is just an example of this. Well, I believe that the one thing that has not changed is the definition and attributes of healthy buildings. I mean, we never, that, despite of all those changes that we see, we still need a, a building that uh, creates conditions that are um, do not create risk for occupants in buildings. So the basic definition of healthy building, I think it was coined a long time ago, probably in Sweden also, in connection with the um, first healthy building conference uh, that was in Stockholm, that uh, a healthy building should not compromise the basic human requirements, which include high quality of life, good health, and optimal physical and mental activity. A new factor that is also that should be considered uh, in uh, 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 when discussing healthy building is a human diversity. I mean, we are more and more paying attention to people, to differences between us. And I will come back to this uh, also in a moment. So the healthy building, it should not compromise the basic human requirements, then it should not compromise basic human requirements for all occupants in a building not only an average occupant in a building, but also the occupants that have different requirements that are vulnerable and so on and so on. So there are eight questions to be answered. And I have only 16 minutes uh, to do that. Uh, so I will quickly um, jump from question to question and try to answer them. And, um, and then, um, uh, I will jump between slides uh, to, um, to advance to different questions, uh, but my presentation uh, will be available um, afterwards and the questions can be asked uh, uh, if I need to elaborate more on some of them. So there are uh, seven major and eight uh, additional question eight is about the uh, pandemic, current pandemic, that uh, actually still uh, need uh, um, answer in order to further um, uh, our uh, thinking and improve uh, healthy building design. The first question is about building standards. So how do standards and guidelines perform in relation to conditions in the buildings and how do green buildings perform? This is a crucial, uh, crucial I think, question here because, because we, uh, if we do research, we, of course, we provide um, information that goes into the guidelines, building codes, and the standards. And these are those documents that define the standards of the built environment. And if they are not improved, then the built environment will not improve. And the, to 
in my view, this improvement is too slow. Because I believe that buildings, even the newer ones, do not perform satisfactorily with respect to indoor environmental quality, although they comply with the current codes and standards. So this, this questions the, um, the um, um, criteria and ambition level of the, uh, of the current uh, building standards. We are over dependent on the existing rather crude technological solutions and minimum standards because of the costs and economy and because of and those uh, because of this there is no progress in uh, the entire field and entire uh, uh, building sector and these factors may actually limit innovation and neglect individual preferences so let's just give you an example and uh, just brief an example these are three major studies in europe uh, uh, performed in several bu office buildings in Europe. Uh, this is European Audit Project, Hope Project, and Office. Uh, this, this is about 20 years, this difference between the studies. These are prevalence of different symptoms. Some symptoms reduce, some symptoms stay at a certain level. But still we see the prevalence of, for major symptoms, basically around 20 above 20, maybe 30 percent. So 20, 30 percent of occupants in buildings are still uh, uh, experiencing um, uh, symptoms. So is that acceptable today? Perhaps we should be reconsidering this very carefully. When another example is from Singapore, where uh, the bunch of uh, uh, green certified buildings or green marked buildings were compared with which are green bars here, which were compared with the um, non-certified buildings, which are blue bars. And these are the different uh, uh, satisfaction with different parameters in a building that are seen. So we see that the green buildings are performing better than the non-green buildings. But what we see here is that even green buildings do not perform uh, as would, they would be expected, because the satisfaction level is not reaching the, heart, the, the end of the scale. Satisfaction level is just barely satisfied, even green buildings. Well, this is a wake up call, perhaps, or something like that. The second problem is about the pollution. And that has been, um, uh, that has been a challenge, a holy grail of all indoor air research is what are the pollutants? that are the pollutants um, of interest. So which pollutants we should use to design our indoor air quality, create standards and requirements? Well, the problem is that there are new chemicals and other contaminants that appear in buildings almost daily. And probably the fact that there are new pollutants, new problems coming, we um, are distracted and do not keep the focus on the pollutants that have been documented to, uh, to uh, be associated with problems or adverse, uh, or, uh, or which are harmful for humans. And <clears throat> therefore it makes more sense to work with the information we have on contaminants that have demonstrated harm on the population. And those pollutants are listed by WHO, for example, and in many guidelines. And if we go to buildings, we still see that many of those pollutants are at the levels that are higher than the recommended in the guidelines. So should we not first make sure that they, these pollutants are properly controlled? So, and then of course the question is about the pollutants of concern. Which are the pollutants of concern? So, and there are different approaches to do that in, in order to define those pollutants of concern. One example is the work of log uh, that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives in which uh, they calculated uh, disability adjusted life years based on the concentration of measured pollutants in uh, residential housing in, in United States. You can see here the concentrations are basically jumping for different pollutants, but if they convert it into the risk uh, defined by the DALI, only few pollutants are 
co uh, of concern. Of course, we are talking here about the chronic effects. And these are PM2.5, acrolein, formaldehyde. I do not mention a few others, which are ozone and, and radon as well. And we still see the cities and uh, spaces in buildings with high formaldehyde level, but certainly with high PM2.5 level. And then now the debate about the CO2. Is, is CO2 a pollutant? Well, I have no time, and it, probably it would take the entire talk to talk about the CO2. However, the data on CO2 clearly shows that there are no effects on health or comfort below 5,000 ppm. And the data on cognitive performance that is shown here and was published by, in the paper by Fiskin Asher Journal clearly show that there is no systematic evidence that CO2 below 5,000 ppm creates negative effects on cognitive performance. This is not systematic and not consistent. So we cannot draw the conclusion that the CO2 is pollutant. What really we need to start focus on are the human bioaffluence. Because what we see with reduced emissions from building materials and uh, we are uh, seeing a, a new sources of pollutants that are brought indoors. And these are the occupants and the, uh, and the pollution outside. So all, them, uh, all what we have discussed that the buildings are separating us from outdoors. Now we are also receiving the um, pollution from outside. And this should be the focus. So there is a focus on that. And uh, we um, recently developed a tentative dose response relationship for human bioaffluent that we say that if the levels of CO2 are above 3000 ppm, and the CO2 here is a marker of human bioaffluence, this is a range of harmful exposures to human bioaffluence. Below this, um, below 1000 ppm, this is a comfort range, as we now see in our uh, uh, ventilation standards, Detection of human bioaffluence is about 500, 600 ppm. And between 1,000 and 3,000, there may be some effects occurring if other exposures are occurring as well. I will drop this uh, important and go to another important development. Is also energy has a created situation in which they, there are changes to the thermal, uh, to defining the thermal comfort in spaces. And we have two models, it's a PMV model and uh, a th uh, adaptive thermal comfort model. An adaptive thermal comfort model allows the temperatures to increase and people to stay comfortable by adjusting closing on making any behavioral adjustments. So it is basically motivated by the fact that people can adapt their environment, but also because of the energy requirements. So, we have published a, a new paper this year in uh, which we uh, have documented that this approach may be wrong. And this approach, of course, is based on the work that has been published by Wyon in the uh, 70s, who showed that there are no difference in cognitive performance for people who are closed for comfort in temperatures between 18 and 23 degrees. But we didn't. Uh, have any information on uh, what is happening above 23 degrees. Of course, uh, below 18 degrees is not that much interest because no one is keeping the buildings below 18 degrees. But adaptive thermal comfort model extrapolated this finding and said, well, if you stay comfortable above 23 degrees, there will be no negative effects. The new work by Lana Tal published in, in Dorer this year shows that the cognitive performance and perceived indoor air quality are significantly worse at the moderate temperature of 27 degrees, even when the subjects were closed com for comfort. This is, of course, in a strict, um, how to say, competition with the adaptive thermal comfort model, which assumes that if we are in a thermal comfort, then there will be no negative effects. Also, previous work that is shown here on the left side, and this is data actually from Swedish offices, also from the 70s, clearly show that elevated temperature have a negative effect on the prevalence of symptoms. 
sleep. Well, this is something that we have completely forgotten. We spent our 20 years of our life in bedrooms. High sleep quality is vital for humans. There are documents now that sleep improves cognitive performance, reduce health risks, regulates hungers and fullness, reduce risks for car accidents, improves concentration and next day performance. But we are getting more and more deprived of sleep and we have very little information on what is the relation between indoor environmental quality and sleep. And what are the bedroom uh, conditions in a modern era? So if you go to the tropical climates, people use the splitter conditioners and to, re to reduce energy, they basically seal their houses. So they reduce the temperature, but they reduce, uh, reduce at the same time the air quality in their bedrooms. In our climates, because of a housing insulation, we <clears throat> conserve energy and the temperatures during the summer are increasing. Also, in buildings that are not ventilated, the levels of CO2 increase to uh, and reach 5,000 ppm. Uh, uh, basically, in many be uh, bedrooms around, uh, around the world. So we have some evidence on the effects of temperature on sleep. And we know that it's difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep when the bedroom is too cold or too hot. And sleep it seems to be enhanced when the bedroom temperatures are warm when falling asleep and when waking, but cool in between. And there is no single temperature that is ideal at all stages at night. And we also know a little bit about the indoor air quality and sleep. And we recently published a paper uh, summarizing measurements of ventilation and sleep and proposed a dose, res dose response relationship for uh, bedroom ventilation and uh, sleep. And uh, these are the level of CO2 that define the conditions for undisturbed sleep quality based on the evidence that we have today and possibly disturbed and uh, uh, and the step sleep quality with possible reduced next day performance. These data are only based on few experiments and our, um, I myself with my students, we are running now large studies to document further the effects on sleep, of air quality on sleep. Because of our time, uh, I will uh, quickly uh, go to, uh, soon to the uh, concluding remarks. I want to focus on two important parameters. Is one parameter is the ventilation requirements. We are very much dependent on ventilation requirements in buildings. But if we look at the historical changes in ventilation requirements in buildings, you will see that those ventilations, uh, ventilation requirements have changed and they were not the same. And depending on the criteria based on which they were defined, and the first one, which is two point two, about two liter per second person, and uh, uh, these are for the miners, and basically to keep the uh, candle, uh, um, uh, candle, and providing oxygen to the candle in the mines. Two buildings that were based on the uh, uh, reducing the risk for tuberculosis, and then the entire uh, era of ASHRAE were defined it for comfort. So the problem with ventilation is that ventilation is a mediating factor and not a cause. And if we look at the ventilation impact on our health, there is no direct relation. Ventilation is modifying our exposures. Exposures are also modified by sources. So in, one, in order to improve the indoor environmental quality or indoor air quality, we should focus first on the sources and minimize them and then ventilation and other means of reducing the remaining part should <clears throat> be used to basically modify the exposure uh, <clears throat> to the pollutants. And what we see in the literature is basically relation between ventilation and health. I'll have to, sorry, go quickly to <clears throat> another point, which is sec uh, two uh, final questions, question six and question seven. So what is the uh, uh, um, 
in order to define healthy building, we need to understand what is the indoor environmental quality. This is a summary of indoor air quality <clears throat> um, uh, requirements in different certification schemes, standards defined by European projects and from some research articles. These are the green certification schemes that are mentioned. Uh, if you just give me two or three minutes more on it, I will be finishing. And you can see that there's probably about 90, 100 different indicators. There is no systematic way of defining what is the indoor or index of indoor environmental quality. We have recently proposed a rating scheme, which is called TAIL, for classifying indoor environmental quality. It is based on classifying the quality or rating the quality levels of thermal environment, air, acoustic environment, indoor air quality, and luminous or visual environment. And each of those components, these are all four components of indoor environmental quality, have four different classes. And based on their classes, represented by colors, the overall quality of the indoor environmental is defined. <clears throat> and we are working on a paper that will be soon published that will present that rating scheme. And it was developed in relation to, <clears throat> uh, to uh, um, energy retrofits, but uh, we believe that it can be applied if, to any type of the buildings. Uh, and um, I believe that the reliable IRQ metric is a must. And I will quote this from the paper that I um, published in 2016 with uh, Professor Steinemann from Melbourne University. We wrote that the lack of um, indoor air quality metric or disagreement what should constitute a metric is a significant barrier holding back innovation of indoor air quality conducive technologies, emergence of undocumented methods of measurements, of uh, indoor air quality, claiming their high efficiency and, and authenticity, and so on. I believe that energy people can provide their development so fast because they have metrics or metric to which they can refer. They have a benchmark, they can benchmark buildings. We, um, although this is a very pragmatic, um, but um, we in our field, I think we are missing those metric to which we can always refer and build up the database and benchmark buildings. And that cause that we still, you know, might be staying behind uh, the other uh, disciplines. So what next? So I think we need to redefine the paradigm. There are four important points of redefining paradigm, uh, paradigms. The human is the center. We need to have inclusive design for all. We start to promote not to avoid and health, comfort and performance and sleep quality. So of course, human in a center. If we talk about healthy buildings, we are talking about the healthy occupants in a building. The second point is inclusive design for all. Today's standards define the conditions for this little part of people who were probably the size of a shoe, which is probably 39 on 40. So imagine if you have a size 46, you have to go in 40, or if you have a size of nine and you have to go in 40. So this has to be done, has to be changed. We have to look at the vulnerable group, sensitive people, and all should be included in the design. Our design is also uh, done to avoid risks. So, but avoiding risks is not only one element. We should also promote some other elements. Think about the buildings as in case of food, for example, as means to promote health rather than only avoid the health risks. And then finally, I present a slightly modified definition of healthy building. Um, it, uh, it was in 2019, last year, 2020, I believe the same is a healthy building should not compromise the basic human requirements of every building occupant. This is an addition and foster high quality of life. So it's not only avoid risk, but also provide the benefits and not only high quality of life, good health, optimal physical and mental activity, but also sleep quality. So before I complete, uh, I would say that how should buildings be prepared uh, and operated if, uh, during and after pandemic events? So as I said, there are several different guidelines that have been published on this. And I just provide the reference to Riva, Ashra and Harvard guidelines. 
and pro provide one important para parameter is that buildings or healthy buildings and control strategies, these are 14 priority areas for pass forward in COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll see all, you recognize all those elements that are related to other aspects than buildings, but also buildings play an important role. And I think this is a new area that has to be very well defined because the future pandemic can appear in the future. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking a little bit of time jumping between the slides, but I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And I, um, if you have questions now, later, uh, or any questions that will appear after this uh, seminar or webinar, please do not hesitate to connect with me. This is my email address and I will be happy to address them. Thank you, Aneta, once again for inviting me to this event. Thank you very much, Pavel, for really great uh, presentation.